We are taking a break from 2 Corinthians for the next two weeks as our lead pastor, Nick Jones, is on a trip. And as much as I wanted to continue our expository preaching of 2 Corinthians, apparently Nick was so excited to preach the next section that he said I had to go and find my own passage. But before we look at our passage, um, I want us to stop, and I want to remind everyone how immensely blessed we are with the access to the gospel of Jesus Christ compared to the rest of the world. On a weekly basis, we have the ability to hear the importance of salvation by grace alone, through Christ alone, found in scripture alone, all to the glory of God alone, whether from the pulpit or on Wednesday nights, or in bridge groups, various Bible studies, or simply intentional fellowship with other believers throughout the week. We are familiar with these glorious truths that have eternal ramifications because God has lavished his love upon us. And we know that from Ephesians 1, 8, which you'll hear more about from Chris Coda next week. There are millions of people in the world with zero access to the gospel who would gladly trade places with you in order to have the same access to Jesus Christ that you have today. And this incredible access is a blessing, but it can also be a curse, which started all the way back in the garden. John Piper once said, one of the greatest tragedies of the fall is that we grow tired of familiar glories. What this means is that our sinful nature has this inexplicable ability to grow weary of the incredible glories of God simply because they have become familiar to us. By consistently repeating their importance enough times on Sunday mornings, they can somehow lose their luster in our eyes due to their common regularity. And often, when we become familiar with things, we begin to take them for granted. Paul Tripp builds upon this. Often when we are familiar with things, we quit noticing them. When we are familiar with things, we tend not to celebrate them as we once did. Familiarity tends to rob us of our wonder. And what has captured our wonder of our hearts will control the way that we live. This morning, I want Ephesians 1, 15 through 2, 10 to steal back our wonder from the things of this world from our jobs, from our travels, from our games, from our activities, from our kids' activities, from ourselves. They should all pale in comparison to the glory of our God. And on the surface, when you look at this passage, you might not think that there's any mind-blowing concepts to inspire awe, except maybe for the last few verses in chapter two. But this entire passage screams God's glory. It's full of glories that we are already familiar with, such as the power of prayer, the revelation of scripture as God's words. We are God's glorious inheritance in heaven. Christ conquered all things and put it under his feet, including death, and then his ascension of his physical body to heaven. The church is so connected with Christ that we are the manifestation of his body. God's mercy and love to save us from blindly following Satan. We were dead and now we are alive and the grace of God as a free gift. But considering no one brought their lunch to the church in order to go through all these in depth, uh, I'm gonna focus on four so we can try to get out of here in a reasonable time. I want to remind everyone of four important and familiar glories that they might capture the wonder of our hearts again and then let it radically control the way that we live our lives every day. So turn with me to Ephesians 1, 15. So Perry already read 15 through 23, but we're gonna be going through all uh, 210 today. Ephesians 1, 15 through 210 is a special passage because like we just saw, it mentions so many truths in rapid succession that exalt the glory of our God of what is infinitely glorious, him. But another reason why I'm so excited about this passage is if I didn't tie in missions somehow, I don't think I would be a good missions director. (laughs) 
Um, when we look at these verses, it not only has the infinite glory of God written all over it, but it gives us a million reasons that we should worship God. And here's why worship is important. When we can find continued enthusiasm in God's glory in our own lives, it becomes both the fuel and the goal of evangelism in our lives. For until we can worship the glory of our own God in our own hearts, we won't ever be able to ask others to do the same. So let's start reading in verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. So our first familiar glory this morning is prayer. Prayer is how we talk to God. We do it often on Sundays. We're supposed to never cease without doing it, which is what we see Paul doing here for the church of Ephesus. But let's stop and think about the significance of prayer for a second. When Christ died on the cross and the curtain of the tabernacle was torn into two, God's presence became available to all people. And when the Holy Spirit came into the world at Pentecost, a direct personal line of communication was opened up through Christ as our intermediary between us and this God who is all powerful, all knowing, all present, who made the entire universe and upholds everything by the power of his word. This is the same God that we get to talk to at any moment in time. But why do we pray? Prayer humbles us as needy and exalts God as all sufficient. It's actually quite a delightful partnership, actually. Um, we obtain what we so greatly need, and God gets the glory, which is due unto his name. Don't be confused by that last statement, though. The things that we so greatly need are not the things of this world, but the things of God. Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So you delight yourself in the Lord first so that our hearts align with his hearts, his heart, and then he will give you the desires of your heart, which is the Lord's desires, which is his glory. And he loves to give us the desires of our heart. He loves to answer our prayers, to answer our prayers. In Luke 11, 11 through 13, Jesus is talking after teaching the disciples how to pray using the Lord's prayer. And he says this, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give a fish, instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So remember when I said that prayer humbles us as needy and exalts God as all sufficient, I want you to hold on to that needy part. So we'll get to the importance of that in a minute. So what is Paul's prayer to God for the church of Ephesus uh, in this passage? So let's continue reading in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us of to believe, according to the working of his great might. So this brings us to our second familiar glory, which is the words of God found in scripture. So if prayer is our way of talking to God, how does God talk back to us? It's through scripture. Where is the knowledge of himself found? It's in scripture, which he wrote down for us through men so that we might know what. Verse 18 says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So the words found in scripture are actual words 
of the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, written down purely for our benefit. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says that the words were written down for our instruction. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says that all scripture was breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Scripture contains not a single mistake, perfectly revealing everything that we need to know about God, our un our ourselves, and our world, and equipping us with everything that we need in order to not just combat the devil, but to conquer him by the power of Jesus. Which is why Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 is my prayer for our church too, that he may give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him and have the eyes of our hearts enlightened that we may know what is the hope to which we have been called. What are the glorious or the riches of his glorious inheritance and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? When we pray to God, God answers back by allowing the spirit of wisdom to reveal himself through his written words so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened to what he wants to say back to us. So prayer and God's words are massively intertwined, which brings us back to that needy part. So why are we needy? It is because right now, at this very moment, we are at war. It's not a physical war, but it's still very much a, physical, or a serious war. We have a supernatural adversary in the devil, and he hates us. He hates your marriage. He hates your children. He hates our church, and he hates God. And he wants to destroy you. He wants your swift and painful death by devouring you. 1 Peter 5.8 says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Or if he can't do that, he at least wants to give you a slow and painful death by finding all of the little things that get under your skin and distract you from Christ. In ourselves, we are not as strong as he is. That's why, in John, that's why John says in 1 John 5, 5, 19, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Or later in our passage in Ephesians 2, 2, where it says the whole world is following after the devil. You can't outsmart him by yourself. The world simply has no defense against the devil, none. We are in dire need. The apostle Paul knew this though. He literally addresses this same issue in the very same letter to the Ephesians four chapters later. So he starts his letter to the Ephesians with his prayer for revelation and enlightenment, and then ends the letter with a classic, familiar, and often cliche part of the Bible, putting on the full armor of God. So turn with me to Ephesians 6. verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for our feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit 
with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Satan hates God's glory. He wants no one to be saved. He wants no one to come to the knowledge of truth. He knows that the real battle is the spiritual battle for salvation of the lost. And he knows that the power of prayer and the words of God are the only things that can thwart him. And so what does he do? He does anything that he can to draw our attention away from the real battle. He does anything to have us stop believing that we are at war with him. And in our case, with our little church situated squarely in the Woodlands, Texas, he gives us comfort. He doesn't want us to be needy and dependent on God. And so he gives us stuff. He gives us safe homes. He gives us successful jobs where we can climb the corporate ladder. He gives us hundreds of activities to choose from for our kids to be a part of every week. He gives us fast internet. He gives us lots of online friends. He gives us real-time news updates of actual wars. He will literally give us anything, even good things, if it has even the potential to draw our attention away from the real war, the war that actually matters. He wants zero urgency from us, no vigilance, no watching for Christ's return, no strategic missions planning to the perishing, just easy peace and prosperity. I heard someone mention once that we are in a third soil century. So in the parable of the soils in Mark 4, Jesus says that the seed being planted is the word of God, and he sows his urgent word of kingdom power to all people. But instead of us taking it up as our sword or bearing fruit, we become those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word out, and it proves unfruitful. I like uh, Jared Wilson's summarization of this. The devil would be perfectly happy with us being happy, so long as you're not holy. He knows that happy, unholy people rob glory from God and go happily to hell. So if we truly are in a spiritual war, how do we fight back? How do we defend ourselves and our family and our marriages from a devil who hates us? How do we avoid the generosity of Satan and the deceitfulness that comes with his riches? We are already familiar with them, but I want to remind everyone of their glory yet again. We pray desperately to a God who is all sufficient and we abide in God's word at all times. I love 2 Corinthians 10, three through four, because it reminds us that though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. If we are not reading, if we are not meditating, if we're not memorizing and using the words of God like our actual life depends on it, then Satan has won. There is no wartime urgency. Do you hold the verses that you have stored up in your head more dear than anything else that you can fill your mind with or your day with? How many activities during your week focus your mind on the words of God versus on the fun things of this world. I had this realization the other day that if I discipline my kids without pouring scripture back into them from the root, for the root of the issue of the, that's in their heart, then I'm just teaching them to be a moral person. Don't do this, do do that. And not actually teaching them the why and where their evil intent came from and how to conquer that in Christ through his words in scripture. So memorize scripture. 
Dedicate it to your mind. It is single-handedly the best way to defeat Satan and his schemes. Memorizing scripture makes meditation possible at all times in the day, even when you're away from your Bible. Memorizing scripture makes God's word more readily accessible to you for overcoming temptation, for detecting errors in doctrine, for ministering to others when they're in need, and for combating the devil. More importantly though, memorizing scripture shapes the way that you view the world by conforming it with God's mind, with God's viewpoint. So my prayer for the church at Alden Bridge is the same for the church at Ephesus. May he give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the saving knowledge of him found in his word and have the eyes of our hearts enlightened that we may know that What is the hope to which he has been called by meditating on that daily? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance for us? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe when we pray to him who is the limitless provider of all good things? But God's glory does not end there. Let's keep reading in verse 20. that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So a third familiar glory this morning is Calvary. Thankfully, we cannot go a Sunday at our church without hearing about Jesus and his saving work he did on the cross. But let's spend a few more moments talking about its ramifications of this familiar but glorious truth and try to put a little bit of wonder back into it. Paul, uh, in verse 22, is making it clear that Jesus fulfills Psalms 8, 6, which says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet. We just talked a lot about spiritual warfare. And in, it is, it's good not to underestimate the power of Satan and his hold over this world. But if we contemplate Satan's power too long, we lose sight of what actually happened. Satan has already lost control because of Calvary when the Lamb of God was slain. And not only that, but we read in Luke 10, 19, that God has given us the same authority over all of the power of the enemy. What hope and confidence this should give us amidst a world that always seems to be breaking and falling apart before our eyes. God's plan cannot fail. For 20 centuries, the world has given it their best shot to contain Jesus. They can't bury him. They can't hold him in. They can't silence him or limit him. Jesus is alive and utterly free to go and wherever he pleases. All authority in heaven is his. All things were made through him and for him. He is the absolute supreme over all of the powers. He upholds the universe by the power of, by the word of his power and the preaching of his word is the work of missions that cannot fail. Calvary was this unique, pivotal point in redemptive history brought about by Christ conquering death. Before Jesus, saving faith relied on the forgiving and helping mercy of God displayed in events such as the Exodus and the sacrificial offerings and prophetic promises such as Isaiah 53. Jesus was not known. And the mystery that all peoples would be fully included in Israel's promise was kept secret for ages. Paul says in Acts 14, 16, that 
in past generations, he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. And then Paul continues in Acts 17, 30, when he says that those were times of ignorance, which God overlooked. So we're going to read it together. It should hopefully be up on the screen. Um, Acts 17, 30 through 31. Let's see how that finishes. Verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That word now is a key word in a turning of God's redemptive work, historic work. Something new has happened. The Son of God has appeared. He has revealed the Father. He has atoned for sin. He has risen from the dead. His authority as universal judge has been vindicated. And a message of his saving work has spread to all peoples. This turn in redemptive history is for the glory of Jesus Christ. Its aim is to put Jesus at the center of all God's saving work. Christ be the sole and necessary focus of saving faith. Apart from the knowledge of him, no one has the physical ability to know him um, and be saved. Jesus is the goal and climax of the Old Testament teaching, and therefore Jesus now stands as mediator between God and man as the object of saving faith. Yes, we hear about the saving work of the gospel all the time on Sunday mornings, but when we hold it up and compare it in the glorious light of eternity, that God set in place from the beginning of time a plan to gather a people for his name's sake from all nations of the world, and that this plan cannot fail, it makes our God big. And we can worship a big God. We can serve a big God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly he is to be praised. He is to be feared among every, all the gods. Just like Psalms 96, a heart for the nations starts and ends with singing the Lord's praises from your own heart. God is gathering a people from every nation in the world to worship him for eternity. He will win. And he needs Christ's body, the church, to postpone our comfort and our prosperity temporarily and remember that we are fighting a spiritual battle on a physical earth for lost souls, powered by prayer and God's word. And he has miraculously chosen us to carry out his grand plan. Romans 10, 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Which leads us to our fourth and final glory, the free gift of grace. And what is the good news that we are to share? It's that Christ died for you. Not just you, he died for you. Let's read Ephesians 2 starting in verse one. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom 
all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I think that's one of the most beautiful descriptions of the gospel in the entire Bible. Ephesians 1, 15 through 2.10 should put the wonder of familiar glories back into our hearts. It should shift our focus from the things of this world to the glory of God. And it should instruct the way that we live our lives every day on this earth. We are all familiar with our church's mission statement. We exist to be disciples and make disciples that in everything Christ might be preeminent, that he would be first and foremost in our own lives. Our whole church is built on the preeminence of Christ. Missions isn't just sending people on a trip every once in a while. It should be embedded into the very walls of our church. Whether it's teaching kids back in the children's ministry or leading a Bible study or during discussions and bridge groups, we are using our worship of an infinitely glorious God to fuel our missions and to share the good news of the gospel with a perishing world right here in the neighborhood of Alden Bridge and beyond. Christ should ooze out of us in whatever we do, whether it's being disciples or making disciples. If you love the glory and the preeminence of Christ, you love missions. Your worship of his glory becomes the fuel and goal of your evangelism. It's the fuel of missions, especially here at our church, because we exist to be disciples that in everything Christ might be preeminent in our own lives. And it's the goal of missions, especially here at our church, because we exist to make disciples that in everything Christ might be preeminent among every tribe and language and people and nation. For when we can satisfy our souls forever in God's glory alone, even familiar ones, then our enthusiasm for him will drive everything that we do, including making disciples. Let's pray. Dear God, forgive us for a growing, forgive us for growing weary of your glorious truths. Forgive us for replacing urgency with comfort. We are in dire need of you. Reveal yourself to us through your word continually. Place eternity on the tips of our tongues. Convert your worship of our glory into shoes for our feet that we might put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. For it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And what good news it is that you being rich in mercy because of the great love with which you had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, you made us alive together with Christ according to the working of your great might, which you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead. You are a great God and you are greatly to be praised. May we find our satisfaction in you and you alone on this day and forevermore. Amen.